Welcome back to Open Line tonight. Such an important topic that we all understand. That's what we're talking about tonight. Human trafficking. What does it look like here? What does it look like across the globe? Sometimes that's a little different. I have a great expert here with me tonight, Gabrielle Thompson from the CEO from Free for Life International. Thank you for being here. Thank I think you. as you said, opening people's eyes and helping um, to understand what human trafficking is is so very important these mm -hmm. days. So we can all just keep a lookout in our everyday lives. We've talked a little bit about what human trafficking looks like like here, but let's talk about across the world. Mm -hmm. And you guys do some very important work at some borders. Yes, we do. And and increasingly, it's becoming even more relevant within our country because, as I'm sure many people have noticed, there's a lot of issues that we're having at the border. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, a lot of trafficking, we believe, is happening through the border. Um, but the work that we do internationally, uh, we work in five different countries, but we do a method called border monitoring. Now, border monitoring is very, it's hard to explain to a Westerner because okay. we could never have a, we could never have a um, concept like this because of um, the way that we work within our authority of customs police and things like that. But it, it basically monitors the traffic of individuals crossing open borders to see if people are being trafficked. So for example, where we have our border monitoring station is on the Nepal-India border, which is an open border, meaning that anyone can cross without any type mm -hmm. of paperwork. And it is one of the most heavily trafficked borders in the entire world. And so what we have done is basically set up a station and we monitor when people are traveling via bus, tut-tut, walking, motorcycle, you name it, we're watching for it. We're looking for subtle signs of someone being trafficked across the border. And I, I see your face. You're like, mm -hmm. how does that work? Right, right. right. Um, it basically works through a variety of factors, and this is why it wouldn't necessarily work in the United States. And I do want to mention to those of you that did not hear it earlier, this is how we've rescued 1,300 women. Wow that are being trafficked. Now, so within Nepal and India, you can tell where someone is from based on the color of their skin, the shape of their face, the clothing that they're wearing. They still operate very much within what we would call a caste system. Mm -hmm. or a class system right. is how we would better understand it. And so if we are standing on the border and we see a woman that is wearing nice, very nice clothes with another woman who looks like she's from a remote area, you know, by her skin and the, the shape of her face, and they're traveling together, but the one woman that's wearing poorer clothes that has a different color skin, she looks frightened, she looks nervous, she's looking around, she doesn't know where she is. Mm -hmm. That would be a red flag for us. So then how do you step in? So what's so fascinating is because there is a incredible lack of authority on that border and just in general within that space, mm -hmm they are welcoming to the authority of our border monitoring staff. So they give authority to our border monitoring staff the same way we would give authority to customs police. Gotcha. They can stop any mode of transportation and that mode of transportation will absolutely respect that. They will stop a bus with, you know, say, please stop. They will go on. They will pull off what it looks like minors that might be being trafficked, women that might be being trafficked. They interview them. There is a particular questionnaire that has gone through to determine whether or not that person and is being trafficked and then we intercept. That's also how we've been able to arrest the 73 traffickers that we've arrested thus far within the history of the organization. It's, a, it's a, an incredibly effective, but not only effective, it's a very ethical form of rescue. And that is very important to us. There are many non-ethical forms of rescue within the world of human Explain trafficking. Explain that. What does that look like? So for example, a non-ethical form of rescue would be posing as a buyer, as a man. Uh -huh and purchasing a woman that you're planning on rescuing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of you can see why that would be highly problematic for the healing process of a survivor. Yes. So for us, it's not just about effectiveness of rescue, it's also about ethical, how we are ethically rescuing these women, and are we setting them up for a good trajectory for healing? So once you have that child or that woman in your custody, mm -hmm. what are the next steps for that person? The first next step is taking them to a temporary shelter, evaluating all of their medical needs, psychological, interviewing them, trying if they feel comfortable to get a police report so that we can actually move forward with trying to find justice for the individual trafficking them and also their final destination in India, right? The brothel in India. Mm -hmm. We want to find the top up traffickers. Are the countries receptive to this beyond the border monitoring? Are they saying, yes, we want to prosecute this? No. Mm, that's what Co I hear. Corruption yeah. is very tricky mm -hmm. to work beyond. And unfortunately, in those places in the world, corruption is very common. 
That's exactly what I thought your answer was going to be, unfortunately. Yeah. So really, your chance to change the story and the narrative is at the border there and yes. taking these people really into a protective area and starting their life anew. Mm -hmm. Is it about reuniting them with their family, or is it often that's a dangerous spot or someplace that did not work for them, and let's move on and let's move forward? There's two scenarios. So unfortunately, when you have extreme poverty and you have seven children and you cannot feed your children, mm -hmm. We have seen many cases of parents selling their children. If that is the case, they are obviously not safe to go home. Then we will take them to a long-term shelter where they will stay. Oftentimes, our average stay at a shelter is five years. They will then be skilled, educated, learn how to read, learn how to write. We, we deal with a lot of illiterate individuals. Mm -hmm. um, so that is if their family was involved in their trafficking, anyone in their family. If their family was not involved in their trafficking and it was th through very much a luring process, as I was mentioning earlier, then we repatriate them to their families. Do you find, as with domestic violence survivors, who often it takes several times of trying to to leave to actually leave is that the same scenario when it comes to trafficking absolutely and that's that is what I always used to kind of explain to the layman about recidivism is that they are actually domestic violence and human trafficking have almost the same exact rate wow. of recidivism because it's the same type of psychological manipulation mm -hmm. and abuse and sometimes when you get used to it that's all you know yeah which is absolutely. so very scary when you consider what some of these people are going through. It is absolutely torturous. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's modern day slavery. I want to bring it back home again. And let's just start because we're at the half hour redefining if people are just joining us what human trafficking is. Human trafficking is the use of force, fraud or coercion for any type of labor exploitation or sexual exploitation. We've talked a lot about the sexual, uh, sexual exploitation. Let's talk about that labor side. How prevalent is that here mm. in, in our state, in our city? City. What do you see on that end of things? So we see a lot of labor trafficking. Of course, it's going to be primarily men. Um, in the United States, we see labor trafficking happening within the agricultural sector, the landscaping. We also see labor trafficking um, happening more towards females within housekeepers, um, cleaning ladies, any sort of domestic work that is done, oftentimes um, by what we may call, you know, an immigrant or mm -hmm. such like that. That is, there's a lot of trafficking within that. So a lot of people, their red flags just came up and said, I have a housekeeper yes. who's not from here. I have a nail technician who's, you know, is, is, is Asian. I have this, I have that. I don't want to be part of this mm. equation. How do I know? So one thing that I tell individuals, because I think most people would not want to know, they don't want to be a part of modern yeah, day slavery. Absolutely. So for example, when I have someone come to my home, whether it be to help with landscaping or cleaning or anything, I always ask them privately, what are you being paid? How much are you receiving from the amount that you're working, right? Mm -hmm. So you're working 16 hours a day. How much are you getting at the end of your 16 hours? How are you being treated? That's great. The other thing too is when someone is being labor trafficked, especially if they are being brought in from another country to be trafficked for labor, they are all being housed in the same house. They're sharing a room with 20 other people. Mm -hmm. What are your what's your living environment like before you may even want to ask them money? Who do you live with? How many people are in the house with you? Those types of questions. Do you have a cell phone? Do you have access to your passport? Because traffickers will remove all they will have no belongings and no way to leave the country and no way to have any movement. Oh, so terrifying. Or any freedom. And that's the thing is when we think about human trafficking, we have to think about what, how do we feel mobile? Mm -hmm. What makes us feel the ability to be mobile within our world? One of those things is the ability to have our documents, to have our own items, you know, right. a cell phone, privacy, freedom. Those things are all taken away. So starting with the basics and never asking someone, are you being trafficked? That word doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. to someone being trafficked. Really starting with, do you have the freedom to come and go as you please. Are you able to make decisions on your own? And what, I mean, I worry that somebody wouldn't answer those questions honestly mm -hmm. or be taken aback by them. What are some red flags that there's more to the story? If they're not answering, yes, you know, I don't know, I don't have my documents or so forth. I think, first of all, and we actually have created a um, curriculum for medical providers because that is oftentimes the one place where a trafficking victim will actually go and have conversations with, with healthy, that normal people. Mm -hmm. um, but what we always educate doctors and nurses, um, kind of the first step is establish a rapport, create trust. Even if that takes 
10 minutes. So for you, if you have someone coming to your home, just ask, do you have a family? Do you mm -hmm. have children? What do you enjoy about living here? What did you enjoy about, you know, if they if they moved here from another country, what did you enjoy about living there? Just creating a relationship that is non-threatening yeah. so that they can feel safe when you say, you know, I really want to make sure you're getting all of the money that I'm paying for for this beautiful work you've done in my house. I just want to make sure you're getting it. Are you getting all of this money? Great tip. Yeah, I can see how that would open the door. Let's go back to the lines. We have uh, Marcus on the line. Marcus, thanks for calling in tonight. Do you have a comment or a question? I do have a question. Okay, go ahead. As an uncle of six uh, nieces and nephews, how can we educate our young children on this particular problem? Thank you for asking that. That's a great question, Marcus. Um, I think, of course, depending on the ages of your nieces and nephews, that's kind of a first place to start um, because it, it can be such challenging content mm -hmm. for a young person. It really, we, we vary it based on age. Um, so, but first I would basically say that you need to really start at you know, your body is yours. For even a little person that's four years old, no one is allowed to touch you unless, you know, it's someone that you love. It's someone that you care about. But then also really educating, as we talked about, the luring and the manipulation that happens within human trafficking. Really, I mean, it goes back to what we were all taught about, stranger danger. Mm -hmm. You do not get in a car with a stranger. Do not necessarily have a conversation with an older man that's asking you a question at the mall or with a woman that wants to know something. If it's all forced fraud and coercion, we need to really be aware of how our children can be manipulated. And so I think really starting with the base of what creating a safe community for them, letting them know that they can come to whether it be you or someone in your family to say, if, if someone makes you feel uncomfortable, if someone asks you to go somewhere, really making sure they know that they always need to come back to the parent. And that's really where we start with our, for example, the prevention curriculum that we have for foster and, and orphaned youth is that it's really about a community. If there is a safe space and a safe person that a child can turn to in the midst of what could be a very problematic trafficking situation that can actually decrease trafficking or completely prevent it within those children's cases. Thank you Marcus for your call tonight. Let's hop over to uh, Becca. Becca's on the line. What's your comment or question tonight? Hi. Hi there. Go ahead. Uh, hi. I'm just curious, um, you know, what what is the, you know, the population of children that experience this this terrible thing you know where do they come from i mean are these are these children that grow up like you know in homes that are um you know a mom and a dad and a healthy relationship and they're kidnapped or are these kids that are orphaned or you know where i want to know kind of that background of you know where children kind of fall into this great question thank you becca i'm gonna put you on hold so you can just listen to your tv Thank you, Becca. Um, first, I want to mention that I didn't, that one in four human trafficking victims are children, wow. women, and girls. Mm -hmm. um, and really to answer your question, Becca, globally, I'm going to start there because it's a little more simple. Globally, the, the majority of those that are trafficked that are children are coming from highly impoverished communities, villages, um, places where they are really not able to have any sort of accessibility, whether that be to education, but poverty is the driving factor for that. I also want to clarify that human trafficking is not being taken. That is, that is about 10% of trafficking cases is being taken. 90% of trafficking cases are being lured and manipulated. And so here in the United States, it it is, yes, it's children that, as I mentioned, come from whether it be very healthy family structures, but more often than not, it is children that are coming from places where maybe, maybe they're missing one family unit. You know, it's not a mother and a father, or maybe they feel very alone and they don't have someone um, to really watch over them and care for them. A lot of the survivors, though, that I've worked with in the United States, it's, it's foster care. It's that family unit, like I'm mentioning. They're coming from broken spaces. They're coming from broken within themselves and they are so hungry for love truly and these traffickers as you mentioned will find that vulnerability yes. prey on it fill it fill that void and then exploit them they are traffickers are experts at identifying vulnerability they are experts in that and that's why even part of when I'm training teens and adults and children is your vulnerability they can spot that be private about who you share your vulnerability with. Mm -hmm. 
you know, protect yourself from that. Absolutely. One thing that I've read stories about is children who are in juvenile detention for one reason or another are often um, prime for the picking when it comes to human traffickers because of that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and gosh, it's so scary. These, these children are going from one tough spot to another. It's tragic. I mean, we as a community need to come around those children. Those children, a lot of children that are being trafficked are coming from extreme brokenness mm -hmm. and we need to protect them. Whether or not they are our child or not, or our niece or nephew, they are still children and they need to be loved and, and cared about and protected. Again, some red flags with, um, with Nashville growing and being the it city and on the rise, all the things we like to say, comes with some great things, mm -hmm. great positives. But the downside of that and the dark side of that is just what we're talking about tonight, and that's human trafficking. So when we have big events like the NFL draft or the you know Preds playoffs or whatever it be, mm -hmm. even this weekend with the Let Freedom Sing, you know, 200,000 people coming, what can you look for when you're out and about? So as you already kind of talked about, um, lack of eye contact, um, branding, you know, I mm -hmm. talked about it before, but there's a very particular type of branding that traffickers will use. Branding is always about ownership for a trafficker, so that will include names of the trafficker themselves, money signs, crowns, we see tattoos on necks, um, arms, wrists, uh, lower back, um, also very vague, so oftentimes when someone is brought in to be trafficked at a large event, they don't really know where they are or what they're doing there. So vague or inconsistent stories. So if you were standing in line with someone that's being trafficked or randomly started up a conversation to say, oh, what are you really looking forward to about this NFL draft? Mm -hmm. They don't even know maybe that they're at the NFL draft. They're not able to answer appropriately because they've been transported around the country. Um, but also fearful, you know, being fearful at all, looking around, observing their surroundings. The thing is about when someone is being trafficked, their trafficker is always watching them. Always nearby. Always nearby. So you may see a woman that, you know, looks like she's having a great time and she's laughing and everything is well, but very subtle cues, you'll see the communication between her and her trafficker. So, for example, you may be, let's say, at a crowded bar downtown. You see a young woman. She's flirting with an older man. Looks like she's having a great time. Maybe she's dressed inappropriately. Maybe you look at her for a second and you see a subtle moment of fear or concern mm -hmm. or sadness. Mm -hmm. And then she looks over in the corner and she does some type of a movement. And that is assigned to her trafficker, and her trafficker gives her some type of movement back to say, yes, you can go forward with this exchange. Wow. Mm. So it's subtle cues. Okay. David, I know we have you on the line. We're gonna get to you right after this commercial break, so stay where you are.